Howdy there once again YouTube. My name is Ben Ferriolo and it is my aim to eventually join the University of Washington for a degree in seismology and possibly also volcanology since my interest is in volcanic seismology. Please visit the description box below for the parts of this video if this is too long for you and you want to skip to a specific part. Also, please like, share, subscribe, and visit my website if you like my work. It is https colon slash slash monitor size dot wee -wee dot com and contains lots of information and many things, including a basic se seismic image archive for Long Valley, Lassen Peak, Mount Rainier, Mount Hood, and Newberry Caldera, my own blog where I update people about certain things that I'm interested in, and especially a how-to section including how to read spectrogram and seismogram plots, how to download and analyze seismic data, and much more. So check it out if you wish to monitor volcanic and tectonic hotspots with me. I do have some free time right now, for once, so I decided to make a video. I will be looking at the past week's seismicity for Washington State and the continental United States, along with a quick look at the recent activity at Kilauea and the Lower East Rift Zone and the recent USGS update. I will also be showing recent activity at Yellowstone and Long Valley supervolcanoes for the past three days at the time of recording this video. Looks like we got a good geyser going off on the Upper Geyser Basin. If anything major occurs after this time period, such as a new swarm breaking out, then I will upload a separate video about that. This here is the Old Faithful Geyser streaming webcam, pointing towards the Upper Geyser Basin, which is where Old Faithful Geyser, among many other geysers, including this large one right here, reside. I do, however, wish that the Park Service or someone else would put a streaming webcam in the Norris Geyser Basin, pointing towards Steamboat Geyser. Sadly, there are no webcams at all for the Norris Geyser Basin that I can find so far. Now, for your convenience, here are the locations for the Upper Geyser Basin. You can tell this is Yellowstone Lake. Here's West Thumb Lake right here. Here's the Upper Geyser Basin right here. Here's Norris Geyser Basin far north. This is where Steamboat is. This is where Old Faithful is. And here's the West Thumb Geyser Basin, which is a little bit smaller than the Upper Geyser and Norris Basins. So, yeah, you can tell it's a lot smaller. It's right on the coast of West Thumb Lake. And I think West Thumb was caused by its own separate volcanic eruption. And it looks like it would have been a pretty big eruption, too. Now, let's zoom in. This is the Upper Geyser Basin, where Old Faithful and many other geysers reside. I mean, I, I swear, there's got to be, like, hundreds of geysers here, guys. Yeah, there's Geyser Hill, which is where a lot of the hydrothermal changes are taking place. Solitary Geyser, which used to be called Solitary Spring. And Old Faithful is right here. And let's zoom out just real quick. Go to Norris. Here's the Norris Geyser Basin. Far north of the Upper Geyser Basin. And you can tell there are a lot of geysers and springs here. And Steamboat. I do not know the exact location of Steamboat. I believe it is along here somewhere. Correct me if I'm wrong. I do not know for sure. But I do know Seismic Station YNM is right here. So, hey, let me turn these on real quick. B950, YNR, and YNM. YNM is right there in the Norris Museum. YNR is right here, and B950 is right here. So, yep, that's where they are on Google Earth. Let me zoom all the way out, just so that people know where the three different geyser basins are. Now, again, Norris Geyser Basin is where Steamboat Geyser resides, right up in here. I'm pretty sure in this area somewhere, right there. And that is why when Steamboat Geyser erupts, like it did on September 30th, 2018, as you can see right here, it shows on YNM and YNR. For some reason, the seismic trace from Steamboat, which usually looks quite strong, does not even appear on Borehole 950 whatsoever. I actually have never seen the seismic trace appear on Borehole 950. I will get into that in a minute and the possibilities as why that is. Now, YFT, all the way down here where Old Faithful is is the seismic station for the Upper Geyser Basin, where a lot of the hydrothermal changes are currently taking place. So again, that's why you see the seismic trace from the steamboat eruptions up here at YNM and YNR, because steamboat is within the Norris Geyser Basin. There are a few people out there saying that steamboat is within the Upper Geyser Basin, and that's just not true. Now, seismic station YLT... And brand new seismic station WYYDD are the ones closest to the West Thumb Geyser Basin, which is right here. And you can see turning YDD off, turning YLT on, there's YLT. And the West Thumb Geyser Basin is right here. Now, before I get into the recent activity at Yellowstone, I would like to talk about the Kilauea Volcano in Hawaii real quick. This is the most recent update put out Tuesday, October 9, 2018. 
Right now, it is October 12th at 1.06 p.m. Pacific Time, so they should be putting out another one in the next few days or so. Since late July, the large volcanic eruption along the Lower East Rift Zone and the summit of Kilauea seems to have ended. Of course, it could start back up at any moment, so residents should remain wary of increased inflation and seismicity. So, let me just read this alert real quick. Kilauea Volcano. It is now an advisory at yellow. Kilauea Volcano is not erupting. Rates of seismicity, deformation, and sulfur dioxide gas, em gas emissions are low and have not changed significantly in the past week. HVO, Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, monitoring during the past week shows low rates of seismicity, deformation, and gas emission at the summit and east rift zone. Earthquakes continue to occur primarily at Kilauea Summit, magnitude 2.4 was the largest, and south flank, with continued small aftershocks of the magnitude 6.9 quake on May 4th, 2018. I do not believe they're all aftershocks. I'm sorry, I do not believe that. Seismicity remains low in the lower Urs, east rift zone. In the east rift zone, tilt meters near Puoo and farther east have recorded a slight inflationary trend in the past few weeks. At the summit, tilt meters have also recorded a slight deflationary trend. Both trends suggest some magma may be still moving into the east rift zone away from the summit magma reservoir system. Sulfur dioxide gas emissions at the summit, Puoo and east rift zone remain drastically reduced at the combined rate of less than 300 tons a day. Hazards are still present in the Lower East Rift Zone eruption area and at the Kilauea Summit. Residents and visitors near recently active fissures and lava flows should stay informed. Blah, 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 blah. Yes, it could start back up at any time. And inflation is starting to occur at Puoo and a little bit farther east, including an increase in seismicity. So where is this heading? Who knows? So it does seem seismicity could be increasing along with another possible sequence of uplift, also known as inflation, for Puoo and farther east towards the lower east rift zone. This could mean another round of eruptions could be approaching, so we will keep an eye on this very closely. Some of the recent footage of the aftermath is amazing, with some houses not even touched with hardened lava right against the porches. Pretty crazy stuff. So here are the earthquakes of all magnitudes for the past 24 hours at the time of recording this for Hawaii. There have been 16 earthquakes in the past 24 hours. It was a little higher yesterday, so it is going down a little bit, but it could go back up at any time, obviously. But yeah, there's only 16 for the past 24 hours as of 1.25 p.m. Pacific Time, October 12th, 2018. The largest earthquake within this time period does look like, let me see here real quick, was this 3.1 right here, just north of Kilauea a little bit. Some of them have been occurring at the summit of Kilauea, and some others have been occurring actually at Mauna Loa, too. So we'll see where this heads, and it was a magnitude 3.1 at 9.3 kilometers in depth on October 12, 2018 at 1051 UTC. Here's the helicorder for the past 24 hours for short period seismic station OTLD, which resides just south of the southern edge of the Kilauea summit. It really does appear seismicity could be increasing. Is magma attempting to breach the surface once again? For the sake of everyone there, I suggest you keep them in your prayers. So let's look around at this. Yeah, we got some interesting earthquakes here. We got some actually large ones. I'm thinking this was the 3.1, the largest earthquake in the past 24 hours. Lasted a good amount of time, too. Wow. Now let's check this one up here. I'm looking for any low-frequency earthquakes or any hybrid earthquakes. This one has a very long tail. Let's check this one out real quick. Yeah, looking more like high-frequency volcano tectonic earthquakes. But I'm currently looking for... Wow. Uh, yeah, that does not look natural. That does not look like anything volcanic I've ever seen. Let me open up the other one real quick and see if it's there. Let's see. What was that? That's at 171630. So let's move this to the side. 171630, which would be right here. Let's see. Wow, it actually does kind of show a little bit on the distant seismographs. So I have no flipping clue what the hell this is. It carries a very high frequency, and then, yeah, okay, that's odd. That I've never, ever seen anything like that before. You see this? Look at this. Let me zoom in just a little bit, a little bit more. Look at that. Yeah, that is a very odd signal. Let me go right here and see what they actually look like zoomed in. Very rhythmic. Wow, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, I don't know what that is, so 
So that's pretty weird. Let's look for some low frequency earthquakes. I do not see any low frequency long period earthquakes at all. What is this? That looks like some type of tremor. Yeah, so it does, doesn't look like anything's going to start up today, but we definitely should keep a watchful eye on Kilauea Summit. And remember, you can always download the seismic data for yourself using the IRIS Time Series database or the IRIS Data Select database and use Seismic Program Swarm or Waves to analyze it. Here's the seismic helicorder for the past 24 hours for short period station KUPD, which resides about less than a mile northeast of Puoo on the infamous Rift Zone. We can see the earthquakes here. Here's that large earthquake, 3.1, that occurred north of Kilauea's summit. We've got some other earthquakes here. Again, I am not seeing any long period or low frequency earthquakes, so that is a good sign. And remember when Kilauea was erupting, we saw all those harmonic tremors. Remember that? Thought we would see the harmonic tremor build and build and build, then an eruption would occur, and then the harmonic tremor would be gone. Haven't seen any of that. Thank God. Have not seen any of that at all. Except I don't know what this background tremor is right here. You can see this right here, but then you go just about half an hour later and it's gone. So there's definitely still activity occurring and I wouldn't be surprised if the eruption started back up at any time. So just keep your eye out for that. Yeah, definitely got some strange signals. I don't even know what the hell they are. Look at that. This is so weird. Well, that is it for right now for Kilauea in Hawaii. Next, let's look at the recent seismicity for Washington State in the United States. Here we are at Washington State, where I live. Surprisingly, I haven't felt a major earthquake since the Nisqually earthquake in 2001. Let's hope now that I said something it does not happen. <laughs> Knock on wood! On a more serious note, if anyone watching this felt the Nisqually earthquake in February of 2001, please comment below. I'd like to know your experiences with that. Now, there have been 48 earthquakes reported in the past 7 days for Washington State, and 1,940 earthquakes reported for the entire world for the past seven days. The largest event was this one right here, magnitude 2.9 earthquake at 17.5 kilometers in depth at 2234 UTC on October 9th, 2018. And it occurred far down here. I don't even know what's over here. It says near Topanish, Washington. So possibly in eastern Washington, I think. Very close to the border of Oregon, actually. And here we are on Swarm, and here's the helicorder, the time period that I picked for this 2.9 earthquake that occurred on October 9th, 2018, at 22.34. And you can see it right here. It's a pretty good-sized earthquake, too. Let me zoom out just a little bit. Yeah, let's see. Yep, normal high-frequency tectonic earthquake. Yeah, everything seems normal with that one. Let's check real quick. Let's go to max frequency 40. Okay, yeah, it goes well beyond 40, but the dominant frequencies are around 20 hertz and below. So yeah, a normal high-frequency tectonic earthquake. And again, here's the waveform real quick. Let me just zoom in real fast just to show you. And by the way, this was taken from Seismic Station TRWEHGUW, which is about 29 kilometers away from the epicenter of this earthquake or so. Now let's move on real quick to the recent seismicity for the continental United States. And here are all earthquakes for the past 7 days as of 2.24 p.m. Pacific Time, October 12, 2018. So yeah, the past 7 days, all magnitudes, all earthquakes for the United States. There were 1,089 earthquakes in the past 7 days of all magnitudes. The largest earthquake that occurred within this time period was a magnitude 3.8 at 11.4 kilometers in depth. On October 5th, 2018 at 1329 UTC, I do not know why they have a little tsunami warning right here for just a 3.8, which I find is very odd. Very odd. Let's take a look at this real quick. 579 people felt this earthquake, so it is a pretty good-sized earthquake. A lot of people felt it. And let's see where it occurred. It occurred 5 kilometers southwest of Trepinos. Trepinos? I think I've seen that right. California. Let me know if I didn't say that right. San Francisco is right here. Oakland's right here. It's just south of San Jose, pretty much. And here's the seismic trace from that magnitude 3.8 earthquake that occurred just south of San Jose, California. This is, I tried to find the closest seismic station to this event, so it'll be BJOBEHZ, which is short period vertical, and C is the network. And here is the event right here. It is a very odd looking event. And it seems the dominant frequencies of the coda, and a coda is the entail of an earthquake, seems to be a little higher than usual. 
let's zoom out real quick. Let's look at that. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Definitely a high frequency tectonic earthquake, of course. But let's see how far the frequency range goes. Let's go to 60 hertz as the maximum. Goes all the way up to about 50. Wow, that, yeah, definitely a very high frequency earthquake, guys. Look at that. Yep. Now, the surface waves involved look pretty odd. But, yeah, it's a very interesting earthquake, that's for sure. So now, let's real quick move on to the recent activity at Yellowstone. For seismicity shown on the Hello Quarters on Swarm, I will show the past three days of activity from the time of recording this. So that would be from 2.30 p.m. Pacific Time, October 12th, all the way back three days. Now, here's the activity at Yellowstone, the reported activity, for the past three days total as the time of recording this. You can tell there were only 25 reported earthquakes, so Yellowstone itself has been generally quiet in terms of seismicity, guys. Now, hydrothermal activity, not so much, but seismicity has been generally quiet. It is my theory that a swarm will be approaching soon. So again, there were a total of 25 earthquakes reported, with the largest occurring on October 10th, 2018 at 1153 UTC. But this one actually occurred up here in Montana, which there's actually an earthquake swarm. I'll show that in just a second. But the largest one reported for Yellowstone itself was this one right here, 20 kilometers south of Old Faithful Geyser on October 10th at 2052 UTC. And it was a magnitude 1.7 earthquake at 5.7 kilometers in depth. And real quick, I turned on the terrain settings, so we will show this swarm up here first, just real quick. It occurred just northwest-ish of Bozeman, so we'll show that right now. I'm trying to find the correct seismic station to use, so I'm going to use either NQMA in the MB network or BZMT in the MB network. Here we are at BZMT EHZ MB. For Swarm, the Seismic Program Swarm. Now let me find that largest earthquake which occurred on, I actually just forgot. When did it occur on? It occurred October 10th, which was about the date that they had this small swarm up there. And apparently October 11th too, they had a swarm. So we have a little bit of swarming going on. Let's take a look at that. So it's at 1153.50 UTC. 11.53, is this it? Yep, this is it right here. Let's take a look at the waveform real quick. Yeah, it looks like a typical high-frequency tectonic earthquake. Let me see. Yeah, it's got frequencies reaching up to about 25 hertz, probably goes beyond, with the dominant frequencies maxing out at about 15. It looks like we do have a few other earthquakes here and there. We got one right there. Let's see, I do not believe that's an earthquake. No, that is not. Let's go backwards a little bit. And so the next one occurred, let's go down to the swarm, let's see, I think it was, let's see, on the 11th, so on the 11th is 1202 and 803 and 1142, 1202, 803, 1203, I gotta keep it in my mind, where is it, 1202, that is not 1202, that's not 1202 either, where is it, man, it just does not show, jeez. Well, I'm not seeing it here. That is very odd. 803.42. So it's this one right here. Got some strange background tremor up here in Bozeman, Montana. That is very, and it has a low frequency. Okay, that's a little weird. I'm not going to tell you guys what that looks like, because that kind of looks like something very interesting. You could probably guess the terminology someone would use for this. That is looking very odd, and it does carry a low frequency below 5 hertz. So... I don't know what's going on there, guys. So I'm going to say that's pretty much it for Bozeman, Montana. I'm not seeing any other major earthquakes right now. There were for a few other smaller ones, but the major one was this one right here. Let's move on to the seismic helicopters for Yellowstone real quick. Now, the largest event to occur within the uh, Yellowstone National Park boundary was actually this one right here in magnitude 1.7, 20 kilometers south of Old Faithful Geyser on October 10, 2018 at 2052 UTC, magnitude 1.7, 5.7 kilometers in depth. So let's use Seismic Station MCID real quick for that. Let's go through here, MCID. It was on the 10th, right? I can't believe I just forgot. Yeah, the 10th at 2052. Let's go all the way back. The 10th at 2052, which is this right here. I, I'm pretty sure MCID is closer to this event than Seismic Station YFT is. Let's take a look. Interesting frequency range. It 
doesn't even pass 20 hertz. But the dominant frequencies are around, I'm going to say, 8 to 15 hertz. So this is definitely a very interesting earthquake here. It very mid-range frequency, which is a lot of mid-range frequency earthquakes have been appearing at Yellowstone lately, and they're very odd, because usually at volcanoes you either see high-frequency volcano tectonic earthquakes or low-frequency earthquakes or low-frequency tremor and stuff like that. But mid-range stuff I don't think is as prevalent at volcanoes than the other types, so it's very odd, definitely, that's for sure. Let's check the waveforms one more time. It definitely looks like a high frequency volcano tectonic earthquake but obviously we see right here that it doesn't even go past 15 20 hertz so that is very interesting this right here is a teleseism and let's go up here this one looks like a regional earthquake here so now that i showed this earthquake here the largest event it was a 1.7 earthquake at what was it 5.7 kilometers in depth let's move on and see the recent activity let's start with ymc first go all the way to the start all right here we go. Duh, that does not look like an actual activity. This is a teleseism. Let's go to MCID for the same time. 755.10. 755.10. Where are you? Where are you? Right here. 755.10. Yep, that is a teleseism, guys. A very long, distant earthquake. Now let me go to the spectral just to confirm it real quick. Yep, below 1 hertz. Telseisms usually show up with dominant frequencies below 1 hertz. This is an interesting earthquake right here. Oh, Spectral is saying it is high frequency. Oh, whoa, something happened there. There we go. Again, it has a mid-range frequency, it almost looks like. Very odd. So let's go back to YMC and just look at some of the local small earthquakes that have occurred. Here is one right here. Does not really surpass 1,000 much at all. Let's go down to the next earthquake. Not an earthquake, not an earthquake. Nope, nope, nope. Don't know what this is. This is interesting. Let's see. Huh. Then could be a regional earthquake. I'm not sure. This definitely looks like a regional earthquake right there. Let's go down. Nothing really major. And this, this is very odd right here. Let's see if that shows on the surrounding seismograph. So that is for the ninth. At 21.50.40, let's go to the 9th at 21.50.40. Go down, 21.50.40. 21.50.40, which is right here. I don't see much starting right here, but look at this. It almost looks like the same thing is right here, but it starts at 21.48.10. Now let's go back to 21.48.10. You can see 2148.10, there's nothing here, but look at this. Going towards YMC, it almost looks like something was traveling underground, because this appears on YMC after it appears here on MCID. Suggesting that both of these could be surface events, but, and I say but, if something is traveling underground, like let's say there's like an underground tunnel, and there's like a big train passing through, it would look like this. Like it would show miles and miles away, a few minutes before it shows... On the seismograph it's getting closer to you know you know what i'm trying to say so that is very odd that this pretty much the same signal appears only a few minutes later on ymc remember if it's an actual seismic event a stationary source propagating away from this epicenter then it would show on the seismographs virtually at the same exact time virtually depending on how close to the seismographs the event occurred but this is actually a few minutes later so i don't know it almost looks like something was traveling through the ground i'm not saying it is but the waveforms appear very similar. and I don't know. You guys be a judge on that one. Let's go to the next one. This is a another mid-range frequency event. Look at that. It's not even going past 20 hertz with dominant frequencies around four, 3 to 4 hertz to about 11 hertz. Right there. Let's go down. Let's see here real quick. Let's see if there's any more. There's a bunch of little other tiny microquakes. Here's a spectrogram of that one. You see another one right here, another one right here, another one right here. See, this is so much easier than using the online helicorders, guys, because you can actually zoom in and analyze these events very closely instead of just looking at the online graphs going, hmm, what could that be? Let's see. Again, this looks like a regional earthquake. 
and see there's another one right there i don't know if i already showed that one or not this looks like another regional earthquake as well so nothing major nothing major we do have a few teleseisms from large distant earthquakes and between the 9th between october 9th and right now there have been some pretty major earthquakes including a 7.0 but i'm unsure which one of these that actually is could be this one or this one i'm unsure actually why don't we just go check real quick let's just check why don't we Make the video a little longer. All right, so the 7.0 occurred on October 10th. October 10th. So, it's, yeah, so October 10th at 2048. Let me show you an example. It was a 7.0 in Papua New Guinea at 40.3 kilometers in depth. October 10th, 2018 at 2048 UTC. Now, October 10th at 2048 UTC. Now, remember, if it's far away, as far away as Papua New Guinea is, it's going to take a good half hour to an hour to reach these seismic stations at Yellowstone. So let me show you this real quick. And notice, no other major teleseism appears in this area right here, which is where it would appear if the 7.0 showed up. So this is obviously the signal from the large 7.0 that hit Papua New Guinea. Let's see if there's any other earthquakes that we should keep an eye out for. No, I'm not seeing much there. Don't know what this is. This looks like a microquake. I'm not sure. A distant microquake, possibly. Let's go down, go down. That one's very weird. And again, once again, mid-range frequencies. Notice that? Isn't that odd? Yellowstone has been seeing a lot of mid-range frequency earthquakes as of late. Why is that? This one appears like a little tiny microquake, another tiny microquake. So really, it ha seismicity has been virtually low. Compared to all the changes, the hydrothermal changes that are occurring at Yellowstone right now, I am very shocked. Very surprised that we have not seen a large earthquake swarm. Knock on wood. Because <laughs> really that could change at any moment. Here we are at YFT HHC, which is the graph. The uh, broadband vertical graph for Old Faithful. Now when you go here to isthisthingon.org and you see YFT, let me show you real quick. Press right now. Here's YFT. Notice how it says SHZ. Well, Ben, why don't you just use the short period vertical station? It obviously says SHZ right there. Well, actually, the only short period vertical stations in the park are the ones that say EHZ. All of the stations that say SHZ are broadband stations that are filtered to look like short period stations. They filter out the lower frequencies before, below 1 hertz using a 1 hertz high pass filter to form it into an SHZ channel. Yes, that is possible and they do do that. And I, you can even do that yourself when you analyze Swarm too. So it is kind of strange. Look at this real quick. Look at this helicopter. It is almost impossible to read, especially when we have some teleseisms breaking through. Like, holy crap. Look at that. It is almost impossible to read. And this here is obviously a... Yeah. Does that look like an earthquake or a tremor, guys? Hmm. <laughs> not, not really. Look at that. Oh, my God. Look at that. That is definitely a telemetry issue. Oh, wow. That is probably... If that was an earthquake, I'm pretty sure everybody in the whole world would be dead and the earth would have been cracked wide open. <laughs> Look at that! Oh my god! Wow, yeah, something really was going on there, jeez. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what they do to create the SHZ channel from a broadband station. That's why the SHZ channels, when you notice large teleseisms, show the waveforms of the teleseism a lot better than the short period stations do. That's why if you notice, next time there's a 7.0 or an 8.0 earthquake, go look and compare the SHZ channel to an EHZ channel where they both show the teleseism very well. And you'll notice they do look different. So they do a high pass filter with the minimum frequency of 1 hertz. But for me, I usually like to do the minimum frequency of 0.7 hertz. Now, let's go back. Remember how wavy the waveforms looked? Well, now it looks like a short period station, doesn't it? Yep, that looks short period to me because the frequencies below 0.7 hertz have been filtered out. Now let me go back real quick and just disable it. And there it is. Notice the difference? That is what a broadband station looks like. Let me zoom out a little bit. See that? That's what a broadband station looks like. It, it, it shows every frequency in the whole world pretty much. But short period vertical stations usually only show her um, frequencies about 1.0 hertz and above. 
So that's another reason why these programs are so great. So if you see things like this and it's just, you can't see much at all because of how squiggly and wavy the lines are. Well, you can change that in Seismic Program Swarm. Now real quick, let's show YLT, which is right near the West Thumb Geyser Basin. Let's see if we can see any earthquakes here. You can't really see much. One reason why I really like Seismic Station YLT is because it is far less prone to surface noise than other stations within Yellowstone are. Now, of course, surface noise can happen, obviously. Here's the teleseism, by the way. Um, of course, they can happen, obviously. Surface noise does happen, but it's a lot, a lot less prevalent than at other stations. And I'm still trying to figure out what these strange events are. Notice they're below 5 hertz, once again. Below 5 hertz for that, once again. And you can tell something's going on below 5 hertz. You notice that? But then when I look on the surrounding stations, it doesn't show at all. So this could be some localized event, just a little ground vibrations. Because this uh, seismic station is right on top of the magma chamber, pretty much. So who knows what that is? But I'm not seeing anything major or anything indicative of magma intrusion. Remember, magma intrusion, when it happens, magma is hot, right? Okay, so now get this. Magma is very, very hot and very, 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 very powerful, and filled with gas, you know, there's a lot of pressure down there, right? But what's surrounding the magma chamber? Rock, right? It's not like, it doesn't just have a free path to the surface. If it had a free path to the surface, it'd be erupting right now. But the thing is, is when magma intrudes into the crust, it will always create an earthquake swarm. I'm sorry to say it, some people may not like what I have to say about that, it will always create an earthquake swarm. Magma is powerful compared to the power of the pressure from the rock above, even if it isn't under a lot of pressure. Breaking a, apart rock down there, j just think of it. When magma pierces the crust and it breaks apart all that rock and tries to make its way to the surface, how can it break away the rock silently? Just ask yourself that. It can't. It seriously cannot. If you want to understand some of the things about spectrograms and seismograms, you could always... Real quick, where did it go? You could always visit my website real quick. Let's go to it. And simply, it's actually got some very good information. Just simply go to more, drop down menu, how to read spectrograms, seismic plots, and more. And I'll get back to this in just a second. So let's just go look at YML. Still seeing those very weird, peculiar rhythms. YML shows these very odd seismic rhythms. You see that? One blob there, one blob there, one blob there. It's almost constant for years and years and years. And it, it sometimes reaches about 100 to 200 amplitude count, which to me is pretty strong to be just simple background microseisms. So who knows? And there's an earthquake right there. So activity, seismic activity at least, has been very low, but I am expecting a new earthquake swarm to break out at any time. So please, keep an eye out for increased hydrothermal changes, increased uplift, and increased seismicity. Here we are at the GPS deformation charts for Yellowstone. Let's go to LKWY. This is the deformation chart, which resides on the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake. Remember, the first chart here records horizontal east-west ground deformation. The middle chart right here records horizontal north-south deformation. And the last chart here shows vertical uplift subsidence, also known as inflation deflation. Actually, I do show these charts in my monthly volcano updates. The last major uplift sequence for this area and other areas directly above the magma chamber as well stopped around the start of 2016, which is right around here or so. Since then, subsidence has been occurring with a few small jumps here and there. However, it recently seems that subsidence has possibly stopped. You see that right here? Let me zoom in real quick right there. You see that? Looks like subsidence has stopped. But it is too early to tell if this is another uplift sequence like the last two we have seen since 2005. If the recent hydrothermal changes gain momentum in conjunction with a new uplift sequence and good sized swarms, then that is the time to worry, at least a little bit. However, in regards to Yellowstone, you really never know what will happen. Yellowstone is for sure one of a kind. Remember, from the negative 0.2 meters here at the bottom to the 0.1 meters here at the top, this whole chart right here, is only a difference of 0.3 meters. So uplift hasn't been too extreme, even in the past uplift sequences, but it has been occurring enough to keep a watchful eye on the area. Remember to always read chart labels, please. 
Now let's go back. Let's go to NRWY in the Norris Geyser Basin, which resides somewhat near Steamboat, I bet. Remember, this is horizontal east-west, horizontal north-south, and vertical uplift subsidence. For some reason, Norris seems to have a different uplift sequence than those areas directly above the magma chamber, even though Norris does not reside directly above it. Of course, since the magma chamber is 5 miles deep and deeper, magma could attempt to breach the surface, probably well beyond the caldera boundary. It seems uplift is continuing once again, as it has been since the start of about... Yeah, about the start of this year. We will watch where this is heading. Notice the entire chart from top to bottom, from negative 0.1 to, to 0.15, that is only 0.25 meters. So nothing too major, but still enough to keep a watchful eye on this area. Now here are the past seven days of tilt data for Borehole 208 tilt meter, which resides pretty much right next to Seismic Station LKWY on the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake. Now remember how you always, always must read chart labels first before you read the data that's provided? Well, for those who don't know what tilt meters are, USGS actually gives a pretty good explanation. Measuring tiny, tiny changes in the slope, angle, or tilt of the ground and the shape or strain in the Earth's crust are time-tested methods for monitoring volcano deformation caused by moving magma. Tilt measurements have been used to monitor volcanoes in the United States since the founding of the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory in 1912. When magma accumulates beneath the ground, causing the surface above to inflate, the slope of adjacent areas will usually tilt away from the center of uplift. Conversely, if the ground deflates as a consequence of magma draining from a subsurface reservoir, the slope of adjacent areas will tilt towards the center of subsidence. Like a carpenter's level, an electronic tilt meter uses a small container filled with a conducting fluid and a bubble to measure a change in slope. Tilt is measured in microradians, which is a small fraction of a degree. One microradian is equivalent to 0 0.00006 degrees. It's approximately the tilt caused by placing a dime under one end of a beam that is one half mile long. The Volcano Hazards Program uses a variety of tilt meter types, but instruments placed in shallow boreholes, 1 to 6 meters, 5 to 20 feet deep, produce the best results because the sensors are insulated from noise that is common at Earth's surface. For example, changes in temperature and pressure. And this is not talking about seismic noise, it's talking about noise that can affect how the tilt meter records the slope and the change in how the ground is deforming. So a tilt meter is another way to monitor deformation. So now you understand this shows the slope or tilt of the ground and that one, one, just one microradian is equivalent to 0 0.00006 degrees. So it really can show minute detail of how the ground moves up or down daily. Remember, GPS deformation instruments record how the ground is shifting horizontally towards the north, south, east, and west, and records how the ground is shifting either downwards or upwards. Ch tilt meters, on the other hand, are different since they detect changes in the slope or the tilt. Of course, the consequences of uplift or subsidence will be seen on tilt meters, but they do not directly record uplift or subsidence like GPS instruments do. Since in math class, they teach us X is horizontal and Y is vertical in regards to mathematical charts or graphs, I believe the X plot here records east-west tilt and the Y plot here records north-south tilt. Please correct me if I am wrong, but that is what I was taught in math class. The X plot, the X tilt plot for B208 for the past seven days has a complete microradian range of only 0 0.7 microradian, so that's less than one microradian. And the Y tilt plot for borehole 208 for the past seven days has a range of 1.4 microradians right here. That whole range is 1.4 microradians. Now let's scroll down to the past 30 days. Here is the past 30 days for borehole 208 at Yellowstone Lake. The X plot has a total microradian range from bottom to top of almost 1.1 microradian. And the Y plot here shows a current total range from top to bottom of about four microradians. So that's a little bit over four microradians. So that's a little bit larger than what we've seen on the other plots. So remember, always look at chart labels, pretty please. Here are the tilt plots for borehole 950, which resides in the Norris Geyser Basin somewhat near Steamboat Geyser. The past seven days, we see the X plot has a complete microradian range of about 
0.7 microradians or so. Almost the same of what we saw at borehole 208. Almost the same range. And the Y plot down here shows a total range from top to bottom of about 0.6 to 0.7 microradian range. And we go down to the past 30 days of tilt for Norris, and you will see the X plot here shows a total range from top to bottom of, I'm going to say, probably about one whole microradian. And the Y tilt here shows a whole range of about one whole microradian. Remember, one microradian is equivalent to 0 0.00006 degrees, which is approximately the tilt caused by placing a little dime under one side of a beam that is half mile long. So, next, let's real quick move on to this re the, one of the most recent steamboat eruptions and looking at its seismic trace real quick. Now let's real quick talk about Steamboat Geyser Seismic Vibrations. You can see the seismic trace right here. This is the seismic trace for Steamboat Geyser's eruption from Seismic Station YNM at the Norris Museum within the Norris Geyser Basin for the eruption that occurred at 6.55 p.m. Mountain Time, September 30, 2018, also known as 055 UTC, October 1, 2018. Now let me open the waveform just real quick. Do you notice how strong the amplitude is right here, by the way? Look at that. Almost up to 40,000. So let's zoom out a lot. Let's zoom out as much as possible. That looks like a volcanic eruption. I mean, obviously it's not. It's a geyser eruption. But that is somewhat what a volcanic eruptions look like when they occur. Sometimes. Mount Redoubt in Alaska actually had a volcanic eruption in 2009 that looked very similar to this. Although it was way stronger. But notice that the eruption lasted such a long period of time that I had to zoom out a lot. Now look, there is the total eruption right here. Notice how much you can zoom out on this program. That's why I love this program. Let's zoom in just a little bit. Let's go all the way to the beginning. There it is right there. Now let me click. Here is the spectrogram associated with the steamboat eruption. It seems the seismic trace we are seeing is only a surface vibration from the event, not the actual signal from the water traveling through the system up towards the surface. Now, why do I say that? Well, for starters, it is the fact that the start of the eruption is always the start of the seismic trace. Not only that, but look at how far this frequency goes. It goes well beyond the preset 25 hertz for this program. Notice it starts right about here with the lowest frequency appearing to be 10 hertz. That's the lowest frequency involved. So now let's go up here to Helicordish settings real quick. And let's do a total frequency range of 55 hertz, which is very high. Woo-wee! Look at that! You could tell the lowest frequency again is about 10 hertz, while the highest frequency reaches up to almost 50 hertz. Do you see that? Let me zoom in just a little bit. Look at that. Up to 50 hertz. My good lord, guys. Let me go down here where there's not supposed to be any activity. Notice that? By the way, if this was volcanic activity, it would be appearing down here at the bottom. Usually if a harmonic tremor and other signs associated with magma movement are usually of a low frequency, not an extreme high frequency. That's why at times when you see strong storms on seismographs, I'm not talking just about uh, at Yellowstone, but other places as well, it usually carries a very high frequency. Because usually surface events do carry a higher frequency than anything else that occurs below the crust. Usually, I said. So guys, yeah, this is pretty much the surface vibrations from the steamboat eruption. Let me zoom out real quick just to show the entire eruption from start to finish. I'm pretty sure, yep, that's it right there. Pretty cool, huh? Now let me go back to the waveform real quick and just do that. Let's see how close we can get. What it looks like, very close to, very jagged, yeah, very high frequency. So real quick, I want to go, let's click out of that. Let's go to borehole 950 real quick. I want to show you something. Now another reason that when looking at the data from borehole 950, which is very close to Steamboat Geyser, you don't see much of a change at all. So the steamboat eruption happened at 055 UTC on the 1st, which is also 655 PM Mountain Time, September 30th. So let's go right down here to, here's the time frame. Let me zoom out. And do you see any change besides those strange spikes? What are those spikes? Let's see. Yeah, those don't look like an earthquake. But you don't see the eruption at all. Where is it? Where's the eruption? Let me go to the spectrogram real quick. 
all the way back, all the way forward, nothing. Look at the time frame again down here, guys. 055, nothing. Don't see anything at all. Not even back here. So where is it? Where's the steamboat eruption? Why doesn't it show on here? Well, let's go to YNR real quick. It does show the steamboat eruption on YNR. Let me do a high pass filter enabled of 0 0.7 hertz. Whoops, 0 0.7. There we go. And let me zoom out real quick. Notice how on YNM, the maximum amplitude count went beyond 50,000. But on YNR, which is very close to YNM, it only shows a maximum amplitude count of about 200. So that shows that the surface vibrations weakened considerably the farther away it goes from the source. So that is probably one reason why we do not see steamboat eruption seismic traces appearing on borehole 950, because it is a surface event. Now, usually strong surface events would still show on a borehole. Like, let's say you did a quarry blast near a borehole. That would show on the borehole, usually. So again, we don't see it much at all, but we did on Seismic Station YNM. If you want to prove this yourself, you actually don't have to analyze it with Seismic Software, though I suggest you do. But next time Steamboat erupts and you witness the seismic trace of the eruption, immediately go look at Borehole 950 and you will notice you don't see much. That is because, for some reason, this seismic trace here of Steamboat and many other eruptions before it is composed only of surface vibrations. For some reason, these instruments are insufficient in detecting the flow of hydrothermal fluids itself. But I am unsure of that. I still need to do a little more research in that arena. Well, guys, that is it for right now. I spent way too long on this video, a lot longer than I was planning on. So I'm not going to be showing activity of Long Valley in this video. I'm so sorry. I know I said I would. But I'm going to make a separate video in the next few days about Long Valley. Just Long Valley. That's it. A brand new Long Valley video all by itself about the recent seismic activity there. Showing waveform plots, spectrogram plots, and, you know, other stuff. But yeah, I spent way too long on this video. I was going to put it in this one, but I will just make a new one. So that's it for right now. Remember, if anything major happens by the time I upload this video, I, of course, will make a second video. Hydrothermal changes continue in the Upper Geyser Basin, and although it has been cold there lately, the whole basin really has been steaming a lot. This is far less steaming than I've seen the past few days. Even Split Cone Geyser, which is the mound right here, which is just to the left of Old Faithful, has been steaming a lot more lately, with a few actual water eruptions here and there. This could signify the magma chamber is growing hotter. If, and I stress the if, that is true, then we will see another round of uplift sequence coinciding with large earthquake swarms like we saw in February 2018 and June 2017. Remember though that the size of a swarm is not the only important thing. It is also the characteristics of the events that take place. For example, the swarms near the Maple Creek area seem to carry a far higher magnitude and quantity than elsewhere in the Yellowstone boundary. However, the quick, fast-paced earthquake swarms that occur at the tip of West Thumb Lake at Yellowstone Lake are smaller and shorter, yes, but may be of more significance than the swarms that occur near Maple Creek. It is my theory most of the rapid succession earthquake swarms at West Thumb are caused by a weakening of the crust from a small amount of magma that keeps trying to pierce the surface. Now, if you guys want to learn how to monitor seismic hazard areas with me, please come visit my website here. The homepage is just has a site map and an explanation of what the site is about. You will see seismic image archives are actually right here. Notice there are six pages, five of them for volcanoes, Lassen Peak, Long Valley, Newberry, Mount Hood, Mount Rainier. I do not do an archive for Yellowstone because is this thing on .org slash Yellowstone has their own archive right now. And use station locations shows the location of all the stations that I use for the seismic image archive. Remember, there is a more drop-down menu which actually contains most of the content on the website. So don't forget to go to the more drop-down menu. And notice we got multiple things here including earthquake examples. This page is always being added to as new examples become available. You notice I already have a good amount of them, but I will be adding a few more in the next few days. I even made my own examples from a DLP that occurred under Mount Rainier in 1998 and a few other ones here and there. Oh, and this one's a quarry blast. So I'll be adding more to this too. But I feel one of the most important pages on the website is under the More menu, the How To menu, Read Spectrograms, Seismic Plots, and more. 
I do believe this is one of the more important pages on my website. It took a lot of time to compile this, so please come read it. It's going to teach you how to read the online seismic charts called web recorders, how to read spectrograms, how to read seismogram waveform plots, how to read frequency spectra plots, and much more. I spent a great deal of time, again, on this page. So you're going to find there is a lot of helpful information here. I even show you incremental stages of when you zoom out using Swarm and how things get smaller. I talk about the UNAVCO spectrograms and why I do not like them. I talk about the different frequency ranges, the different settings, the different uh, power level, showing many different types of waveform plots that you will encounter, and then a spectral analysis plot. Also, if you want a very quick explanation on a spectrogram, then please visit this link here. PNSN, the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, has a very, very good explanation as to what spectrograms are and how to read them. But mine, my explanation on my website is longer, yes, but it's far more in-depth than their explanation. But it pretty much reiterates the same exact thing. So I want to thank you guys again for all your support. Again, please let me know if there were any mistakes or inconsistencies in this video. I do accept constructive criticism, but remember, the key word there is constructive. I will not listen to disrespectful comments, guys. Just saying. <laughs> so that's it for today. I thank you all again for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful day. I will always stand for the truth no matter where it leads. By the way, I think I'm getting sick. I do have a sore throat, and I'm so foggy-minded right now. No, I do not want to get sick. Oh, man. That's really going to suck. But again, I will always stand for the truth no matter where it leads. Why? Because truth is hate or fear to those who hate or fear the truth. God bless. Ben Fariola signing off. Keep an eye out for my coming Long Valley Caldera video.